I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone. I've been told this is the 16th Country Risk Conference here in New York. I've been part of two of them, so uh, I have a ways to go. But I would like to uh, thank all of you for coming, um, our clients in the room, our brokers, our agents, and I have to admit also a couple of competitors. So welcome. Um, you'll learn something here today. I want to just say a few words about COFAS uh, before we move on to the main program. Um, some of you have heard me say this before, but we are truly a company in transition at this moment. Uh, it was a strategic plan that was launched several years ago, two years ago now actually, and it focused on a few things, so a few key issues for us. It's to get closer to our local market. What does that mean, closer to you? One size doesn't fit all in today's insurance market, and we're truly focused on getting back to being a local player in the local market as part of a global company. But another part of that same strategy is to be close to the risk. That means the exact opposite. So if we are a global company, we're gonna have to make sure that we have people on the ground in every country where you, or close to every country, where you might have a buyer request, and we're gonna have those people work on your business. So that's uh, close to the client and close to the risk. And the last piece of that whole transition is to drive out inefficiencies in our company, make sure that we deploy resources where they're needed, and that we reinvest, again, all with this idea that we're going to get closer to you and be a more efficient company. But that doesn't mean that our main values in any way have changed. And uh, anyone in our management team and anyone at COFAS here, you will know and they will know that we're driven by four main values. Client focus, expertise, uh, collaboration, accountability. You talk about those things and, you know, they're easy words to use, but we, we live it day in and day out. In our organization, uh, client focus means what? Well, we're trying to segment the way we do our business. We look at our clients, we look at our uh, portfolio, and we say, well, how do we do this business better? How are we a little smarter about how we deal with our customers? So a small and medium-sized company is going to be treated very differently, at least in how our interaction is, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with, with a very large corporate or maybe a multinational. Not that you're any more or less important, but the interaction is going to be different. A financial institution is going to have different demands than a corporate client. Take that one step further and you say, okay, single risk. Uh, that's not the same as a whole turnover trade credit day in and day out. So there's a different approach to how we do the business. So we try to segment the way we approach the business. Uh, you tell us if we're not succeeding. We want the feedback, but that's definitely the way we're driving our business. The other way is how do we get to market? We're being much more focused in the way we're looking at distribution. And our distribution today is, I hope, and you tell me if I'm wrong, more focused. We have our direct sales force. We have our agents. I think uh, you, you know them. And we're in New York, so we're in Bob Hawthorne's territory here. I haven't seen Bob. Is he here? He's here. Um, and, and the entire team. We also deal with brokers. Now, every broker is not the same. So we have also focused our approach in how we deal with a specialized broker, a specialty trade credit broker, as opposed to a more generalized property and casualty broker. All of this comes into how we deal with uh, our client focus. Expertise. We're a proud company. We're a global company. We believe and we feel we are a leader in the global trade credit world, and we've been so for 70 years. We're in 100 countries. That's a nice round number, but it's a true number. That means you have COFAS people uh, carrying the flag in, in 100 countries around the world. We have 50,000 clients. Uh, we do make more than 10,000 credit decisions at any one point in time. To run a machine of that magnitude requires expertise. And I can tell you the 4,100 employees we have globally, they're focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is delivering a credit solution, whether it's a credit opinion or a credit uh, decision, a credit policy or pay a claim, that's what we do. That's our life, day in and day out. But none of this really works if we don't collaborate, if we don't cooperate, if we're not a team. 
If we can't talk to each other inside of our own company, across walls or across borders, or even with brokers and clients, none of this really matters. So collaboration and teamwork is absolutely key. And at the end, does anyone remember the fourth one? Courage and accountability. Can we stand and deliver? Do we mean what we say? Do we make our best effort every time? And when that claim request comes in, do we pay the claim? That's ultimately why we're here. Those are our four guiding principles. So what's our purpose? What do we do? We're a trade company. We love trade. That's all we do. That's our purpose. We believe that trade is good. I sound like Gordon Gecko. Greed is good. It's not what I'm saying. Trade is good. Trade goes to the core of everything. It drives the economy. It drives companies to be more successful, to grow, to be uh, pillars of society, to really further the cause globally. We believe that trade is good. So we have renamed our, our purpose, and I'll draw your attention to our tagline. It says, COFAS for trade. And that's, that's our purpose. That's who we are. We are a company, we believe in trade. We trade, we support trade, and ultimately, that's our purpose day in and day out. And those are our values. That's why we come to work every day. I'm gonna move on to our uh, speakers today and the, uh, the program. Uh, we're running a little bit behind, so I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move along. But uh, we have a great set of panelists today. Um, Anthony Curry is gonna be our moderator for the day. He uh, is an associate editor with Reuters Breaking News. Thank you. Uh, we have Julien Marcilli, or Julien Marcilli, however you would like to. <laughs> Julien is our uh, chief economist. Uh, he's visiting us from Paris. I appreciate you making the trip. Uh, we have Stephen Tapp from EDC, our friends north of the border, uh, partners and um, uh, friends in, in Canada, and we always enjoy hearing what, what you have to say about all the craziness that goes down on south of the border uh, here in the U.S. But I think from you we're going to hear the, uh, the economic outlook uh, for Canada. There will be a break somewhere in between. Uh, we're going to hear from, uh, again, a French name, Thomas Julien, or Thomas Julien. <laughs> Thomas? <laughs> Um, uh, Thomas is the uh, U.S. economist for Texas North America. He's going to give us a view of um, uh, the U.S. And then finally, we're going to round up, round up today with uh, Marley Baroudi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, she's with MEGA. She's the Director for Economics and Sustainability. And to round up everything we've heard as we've walked, uh, gone around the world, we're going to hear her global overview and economic prospects. Last but not least, our own very own Gina, Gina Grun, and she runs our sales and marketing, and Gina will do a Q&A session later on in the, uh, in the program. And, with, and this is about the last time you hear from me. The last thing is I want to thank all of our sponsors for making sure that this is a success and you've, uh, you've supported us throughout the years, and I appreciate that. With that, I will hand it over to uh, our moderator. Thank you. Well, thank you, Frederick. I'm honored to have been invited to participate, and thank you all for coming. I rely on this thing largely because I write things very late, and my handwriting is atrocious. Uh, I should have been a doctor, although I know nothing about biology at all, so I'm probably in at least not the worst place I could possibly be. But as I keep looking down, do apologize. I did write this this morning. Um, before we start, a few housekeeping issues. Well, a couple of very important ones. We'd love you guys to participate. If you look up here, you can see what we're trying to do. First of all, you can submit questions anytime you want to cr at cofast.com. And also, we will have polls throughout all presentations. Please do participate on the right-hand side there. And this slide will stay up all the way through, don't worry. Um, if you don't catch what I'm saying, I'll, I'll, I'll worry this is going to go. Um, SWSLI.do with the code 2768 to uh, give your answers to the polls as they show up. So with that done, let me just tell you a little bit about me and what well, Breaking Views. So Breaking Views is part of Reuters. We're a bit like, and I say a bit because obviously we think we're better, a bit like the Lex column in the FT and heard on the street in the Wall Street Journal. Basically, as my boss likes to say, we write opinion where we go out and we speak to smart people like you, we take your ideas, we fashion them into our own, and then we try and sell them back to you. So arguably what we are is sort of thieves, really, but you know, my boss says it so I can get away with it. Um, and really what we do, we look at the, the 
financial angles for Reuters, so uh, financial opinion angles for Reuters. So my background, for example, is mostly, and I say mostly because it does vary, mostly covering uh, the country's banks and investment banks, car companies, which means that the whole issue of trade has been on my radar ever so slightly in the past 15 months or so, uh, and increasingly I'm doing a bit more work on climate risk and climate change and finance and that kind of thing. But I won't get into that too much, don't worry. Uh, that's probably a topic for 1,500 other different conferences out there this year. Um, now, what I'd like to do is just give you a brief impression of how we are looking at the world as journalists, as opinion writers, over the past uh, few uh, months or so. And basically, I think what came across our desk this morning kind of sums it up in a, in a weird kind of way. Let me just see if I get this right. So, uh, yeah, we got this email this morning stating that we all risk losing up to 80% of the value of our retirement and other savings, and that the dollar could lose 80% of its value overnight, and that was in capital letters, so it must be true. Now, who's saying this? Apparently, it's a former CIA guy or woman. I actually didn't click through to find out. And who's telling us who this person is? Breitbart News. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that suddenly we're taking sort of these doom and gloom prognostications from this kind of publication necessarily seriously, nor necessarily will they always be wrong in our view, uh, but the point is that they and others are now much more part of the debate than they used to be. Um, and we also have a rather prolific tweeter running this country, although I would say frankly that certainly from my perspective looking at this, and I think we call this quite early on, I think when he was still president-elect, I think from a financial perspective, actually, the impact of his tweets have rather gone down. I don't think stocks generally tend to move quite as much as they used to when he targets a, country, a company, although when he does kind of threaten to, unla to launch nuclear missiles at various people, that probably does have more of an effect. I will grant you that. Um, now, I must admit, as I said, we're not taking these prognostications too seriously, even though as journalists and op-ed writers, especially at Breaking Views, we do like doom and gloom. It's kind of what we're there for. I mean, it's very difficult to find a really positive piece this morning. I'll give you a uh, positive piece of what we do. I'll give you an example. This morning, before I came here, I had to write about a piece about Ford's uh, AGM this morning, where I think the title was something along the lines of shareholders stuff, three potatoes up Ford's exhaust. So as you can tell, we're, we're not particularly fluffy, nice people. Um, but, nor are we always looking just on the dark side. Um, although it's got to be said that, you know, it's got a lot more difficult to try and work out exactly what we should be doing on any given day. And in this respect, as a journalist at the moment, it feels a little bit like, I'm not going to overstate this too much, a little bit like the financial crisis 10 years ago. And I mean that purely from, from these perspectives. Firstly, we're breaking views and probably other outlets are exercising certain brain muscles that either we haven't used for a long time or we never knew we had, uh, covering various things like trade disputes, uh, political issues. That, I mean, political issues for us were non-existent 15 years ago, for example. They've become increasingly important, very important in the past year and a half as financial writers. Secondly, just the time we're spending. So every day we come in and there are things we don't know we need to have to cover, whereas in the past... We kind of knew what things were happening. We knew that banks were in trouble. We knew that car companies were getting out of, the, out of trouble. We knew uh, that you know, Obama was doing certain things. And the world was not easy. We had Greece. We had Brexit. But mostly in the US, we kind of managed it and didn't have too much issues. But now it feels a bit more like the crisis in that we're not just trying to work out day to day during office hours what to do, but we're doing more work after hours in the evenings and more, uh, more work at weekends, which does remind me a bit of the financial crisis. But I'm not going to go too far. I'm not saying you start putting that into your risk models. It's just an observation. I don't think we're heading towards another crisis anytime soon or any minute soon, certainly, and not like the one we had 10 years ago. I just wanted to give you an impression of what as journalists we're thinking and how we're sort of operating and, and, and trying to work through the mire that we're seeing from whether it's uh, the changes in the Trump administration's bringing on trade, on taxes, uh, whether it's uh, on, on what we're going to hear about soon about uh, the global economy, whether you know, many things we're just looking at going, there are so many different ways that we think the various leaders of this world and companies will now react that we wouldn't have expected just two years ago. And that is what's keeping us on our toes. And from journalist's perspective, frankly, it's a damn good thing because it means we've got things to write about and hopefully you'll read us and maybe even pay for it.